Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Hutchison, Grant Park's principal, and I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to our virtual open house this evening. Since 1959, Grant Park has been educating students at the secondary level and offering a broad range of programming from grades 7 to 12. Tonight, you're encouraged to listen to the descriptions of the options that we have available here at the school. Watch the program videos available on the school's website and consider the best choice for your child. In addition to middle school and high school programs, we have programs that help meet the needs of our inclusion support students. When you attend Grant Park High School, you become part of a community that values high levels of accomplishment in academics, visual and performing arts, physical fitness and athletics, practical arts, technology education, life skills, and many extracurricular activities that enrich students' experiences. Throughout the course of the evening, please do not hesitate to ask any questions that you may have about the Grant Park experience. So without any further ado, let me turn you over to our middle school vice principal, Ms. McEachern, to present why Grant Park should be the next stop on your educational journey. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope we can provide you with some uh, clear cut answers to some questions. We hope you've had the opportunity to enjoy some of the videos that our staff have made and put up on the website. If you haven't had a chance to do that yet, I suggest that you do. Um, so yes, I'm Bonnie McEachern. I have been at Grant Park for approximately, I think this is my seventh year, and it's a pleasure and I'm very proud to be the vice principal of our middle school. Our middle school is the grade seven and eight students at Grant Park High School. And then uh, of course, they usually stay in our building and go to grade nine through 12, which is our high school. Um, we're going to start with a few of the most frequently asked questions and some, uh, some questions that parents have already um, emailed me in advance. I have six fantastic teachers online with me um, that you will get to talk to and ask questions as well. We have two from our advanced program, two from our flexible learning program, and two from our general program that will be happy to answer all your questions and you get to put some faces with some names as well. Please uh, be patient with us tonight as we are trying this new platform for the first time. And uh, it's a little complicated from this end, although um, you guys get to just watch from us. It's like switching from one presenter to the other and uh, I might mess it up a few times, so I, I beg your patience. And uh, if you if it doesn't work well, you can always call or email with your questions if you have if you missed a piece or I accidentally muted somebody. All right, so I'll give uh, I'm going to start with some questions that I get every year. Um, the first one is how do we register and registration this year is a little bit different than normal. Part of it is because of COVID, but the other part is that we're just getting more technologically sound. Most of all of the registration information will be on the website and it opens tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. When you go to our website on the second tab over, it says academics and classes, I believe, and it will show uh, it will give you students living within Winnipeg School Division and students living outside of the Winnipeg School Division. So if you aren't sure if you live in the Winnipeg School Division, um, you could give us a call and we can help you out with that. Um, but most people, if you're in Linden Woods, you're not in our division. If you're in uh, River Heights, you are in our division. Even if you're in um, Elmwood, you're likely in our school division. Um, so people with that have that own property in the Winnipeg School Division always have priority to get into a Winnipeg School Division school. That doesn't mean that we don't accept applications from everybody else. When we do get, and those are called school of choice applications for those people who live in a different school division. It's just extra paperwork to fill out. Um, when we get all our applications in, we divide them into three categories. Catchment students have automatic acceptance to our building unless they are in a special program, such as um, inclusion support, which is now what we probably in the past used to call special education. Those students uh, in special education are what we call inclusion support now. They must be um, basically placed by the division. Some of our schools have um, certain inclusion support programs and other so we don't all house every inclusion support program. So if your child is in inclusion support, they must 
qualify for a program here and our inclusion support consultant would be able to help you to determine if uh, Grant Park would be a school for you, whether you live in our catchment or not. Um, other catchment students who are interested in general programming, which would include advanced, flex or general, um, they will automatically get uh, acceptance to our school, but not necessarily for the program they want. Um, anyone who's in our catchment that's a grade seven student who doesn't require a special program would be accepted to our general program. Then uh, we have our division students who would be next on the list. And finally, our non-resident students who would live outside of our division. And we do the same thing for each program. <clears throat> so flexible learning program and advanced program both have different criteria that we the students need to meet in order to be accepted to the program. So a catchment student and a student that lives in the River Heights neighborhood um, or let's say the Elmwood neighborhood, um, they could both apply for advanced, but it doesn't really matter. The person, the child that has to meet the criteria in order to be accepted no matter where they live. That's kind of rule number one. We do the same thing for all three programs. We go through, we always let our catchment students know first, then our division students, and then finally the non-residents. So how long does it take? Well, this takes quite a few weeks to go through all of our applications and place everybody where they need to be placed. We have approximately 100 spots available in our general, uh, general program. We have approximately 50 to 60 spots in our advanced program and approximately 28 spots in our flex program. Again, all these will also be dependent upon uh, COVID with respect to our numbers. May, if we can't fit enough students in a classroom, we obviously wouldn't be able to accept as many students as we normally would. Um, how, when will I find out? You will find out likely if you're a catchment student very quickly. If you're not a catchment student, you will uh, have to wait until all catchment students have been placed. And then finally, division students. So it can take right into June. Sometimes I've even invited uh, students that are on a wait list in October, not October, August. <laughs> October would be a little late. Um, and sometimes I've even called people on the long weekend to see if their child, uh, a spot opened up because somebody got accepted to a different school. And uh, so we, but we will let you know in June if you are, everybody will know by the beginning of June whether or not they're on a wait list or whether they've been accepted. If your student becomes on a wait list, it's, it, it means that somebody else has the spot already and only if they decide to let their spot be released, we would go down the wait list. Okay. Um, back to the online registration. So tomorrow that link will be live and it will have all the paperwork on there that you need. And most of it or pretty much all of it can be submitted electronically to the email address that is provided in those links. If you need a paper copy, you can swing by to our front doors. We will have paper copies at the front doors. And during COVID right now, we have people working those doors to, to work to do the screening as students and people come in. So they will have applications to give to you if you would like. Another question is, is it first come first served? Uh, again, no, it's all based on those three criteria of where you live. We have uh, the two assessments that we have with the flexible learning program and the advanced program. Uh, they, at this time, we probably are leaning to the side that they probably won't happen with the COVID uh, safety protocols that we have to follow right now. But in the event, if they do happen, uh, parents like to know if they can get the results of their parent of their children's um, workshop or assessment and that is an absolute no you are not allowed to see that stuff that is for our data purposes only uh, we I can discuss your child's results with you but you will not be able to see how the child actually performed another question we often have is can my child be considered for the general program if they are not accepted to flex or advance and that is an absolute yes However, we very rarely take students from out of the division for the general program because it's just too full. 
another question I have is my other child already goes to Grant Park. I really want their child, my their sibling, my other child to go there too. What can I do? Um, we do try to help people out with siblings that are already in the building. But again, if you're out of our division, it's sometimes very tricky. We can only allow students in with that don't require other supports um, and if there's space. So if you have a, a little brother or sister of a student who and this little brother or sister may require um, uh, an educational assistant and you're out of division, I cannot accept that child. It's a uh, it's, uh, policy of the provincial government. We just can't do that. Um, what does it mean if my child isn't accepted to, to advanced or flex? Well, here at Grand Park, we're extremely proud of all of our programs. Our general program is by far our biggest pro program, not problem, program. <laughs> It's our biggest program here in grade seven and it is outstanding. We do offer the other two programs as an additional or an alternate learning environment or alternate learning style. None are better than the others. It's just different. So if your child doesn't meet the criteria to get into advanced or flex and you still would like your child to go to Grand Park, of course we would consider them to go into our general program. All our pro programs are outstanding. All decisions that are made with respect, except with respect to um, acceptance are final. So if somebody calls me, I say, I'm sorry, we cannot place you in our building and they call me and they beg and they cry. I really would love to help you, but I just can't. Once the decision's made, it's made. We will not, we will always let you know if you're on a wait list. Um, and we can keep people on a wait list for a very long time. But once your act, once school starts and you're basically told, no, we don't have room for you, it, it's it's a done deal. OK, we do try our best to. Um, help everybody out if we can. Um, the advanced and flex programs also have a teacher recommendation that goes out with the paperwork for for registration here. And we do um, ask that parents maybe try not to talk to the grade six teachers very much about, do you think my kid is a flex kid? Do you think my kid is an advanced kid? Um, because honestly, those uh, grade six teachers, they really don't know our programs. They've never taught in them. Um, they may know some students that have gone to these programs, but uh, asking a teacher from another school what your child is um, going to excel at is uh, they can offer their opinion to us as to what type of learner your child is, but we make the decision. So I have had uh, grade six teachers call me after things have been have happened and they say to me, this parent is really upset with me. They think it's my fault. The kid didn't get in. Their child didn't get in and, and that's not true at all. We have a specific criteria and we don't share that criteria with the grade six teachers. So it's our criteria um, is for us to make our most the most informed decisions and we hope that you would never ever put that grade six teacher in a in an awkward or horrible position of um, being confronted that they weren't didn't write a glowing enough recommendation because I can tell you right now almost every teacher sends us beautiful um, glowing reports on their students. However, a student at Montrose that is outstanding at Montrose now is going to be compared to students from Harrow, students from Brock Horton, students from Carpathia. Then we often have about 100 students apply to those programs for about 50 to 70 spots, often more than 100. So how your child did in a very small school is, can be very different from how they would function in a very large school such as ours. So those and I don't try to be I mean, you know, I'm just trying to be realistic and because um, we don't want anybody's feelings to be hurt. We want the best for the learner at all times. All right. I have opened the oh, we got it going. All right. All righty. OK, so we have some. I think that's it for me. Those were most of the questions um, that came to me advance uh, in advance. 
we I did have a couple more questions with respect to COVID. So I'm going to hang on to those for a little bit because as of right now, uh, it, things could look quite a bit different in September from what they are right now. Um, we can tell you a little bit about how we're doing things as we go through some of the other questions first, and then we can fill you in on what we're doing to keep kids um, happy while they're going through COVID. All right, so this first one I see here is we are in the process of finding. Uh, oops, I lost it now. Uh, OK, technical glitch, glitch number two. We're in process of finding a home in Grant Park area. Uh, something about catchment. If you are unsure what your catchment school would be and you're looking at houses and you have the address, there is a link on the Winnipeg School Division that says uh, find a school and I've had parents who are shopping for schools and they'd like to get into our catchment and they are seeing like four or five areas of uh, houses in the area. If you have the address, you can place that address into the find a school um, link on our website and it will tell you exactly what school is your catchment school. Hope that helps there. All right. So I'm going to pass this next one that talks about what is the flexible learning program. I'm going to talk. I am going to pick on one of my flexible learning teachers. Our two teachers from flexible learning program are Miss Curry and Mr. Semenek, and I'm going to swing this one over to Miss Curry to give you a general synopsis of what the flexible learning program is a little bit about. Can't hear you, Pam. Pam, back up. Can't hear you. <laughs> there you go. Everything good? good? Yeah. All right. All right. Welcome, Welcome to, to our new and improved open house. Um, the flexible learning program is a program where we work with both grades seven and eight kids at the same time, multi-age classrooms. And so we like to do things with them. We work at the pace that uh, fix, fits the kids. But because they in the flex program, they're at or above grade level, we're able to kind of move things along and leave some room uh, throughout the year to do some cross curricular projects, um, to dive a little deeper into subject areas, uh, to really allow kids to, if they're curious about a topic, to allow them the time to dive in and uh, figure out some answers to that. Um, in flex with the grade sevens and eights, then the eights become a bit of a mentor for the sevens. So the sevens will come to the school and the eights will know the routine. Um, they're able to show them around the school if it wasn't COVID as it is now. Um, they work together, uh, the group work. We try our best to um, have kids work in groups and in partners and do partner tasks. Flex is about connecting with the community. So we like to make community connections to go on field trips in a regular year or have speakers come in. Um, through COVID, it's a little different. We just had Manitoba Museum uh, do an online class for us, so we're looking for ways to have those community connections um, within the parameters of COVID, so this year is definitely very different. But yeah, Flex is multi-age, at or above grade level kids, moving at a regular pace, but leaving time to dive into some of those areas where kids are curious and they want to know a little bit more in their studies and, and dive in. Awesome. Thank you very much, Pam. The next question I'll, uh, I'll take, it says, my daughter is doing her grade six now in Winnipeg. However, to me, it seems that her English needs more improvement. Is there any chance for her to have an interview at school so that I can get advice on which program is more suitable for her before I fill in the application form? Um, unfortunately, we will not, we cannot do interviews in advance before that we, they have applied to our school. If you're in a Winnipeg School Division school, in this respect, you could get your principals or your teachers advice on whether or not they feel that she's ready to, go. I'm assuming this is an English as an additional language learner. Um, so they, you could get, get advice from them as to whether or not they will be recommending that she go into a regular streamed program, be, uh, which means that there will not be English um, language support. We do have an English language support program, and uh, so that's an opportunity as well. 
if they're in one of our schools or any school that they could be in, we could also, once we have the application, if, whoa, sorry, our lights are on automatic. <laughs> Awkward. Um, <laughs> if um, they are in our one of our schools and you put in an application, it does have a spot that's asked if they are English as an additional language. Just check it off and we can contact that school directly as well and find out a little bit more about your, your learner. We go, I go through every application individually and uh, so I will look to see what supports they may or may not need. The next one is, is there an opportunity to change the program at grade eight? For instance, in grade seven, she goes for EAL or general, and then in grade eight, she would like to shift to the advanced program. Uh, yes, that is a possibility. We do know that we have new English language learners that do have the potential to uh, move into a different uh, program. And what we do is we do, we do recommend that once a student is new to the country, they have at least a year of Im to be immersed in English before they take on a more challenging program like the advanced program. We usually do have one or two spots available left for our st own students who may be in that situation who we would like to switch up or not up, but to a different program. So there is that opportunity. Uh, the next one, is there generally room for the acceptance of schools of choice students? Uh, yes, we do take probably about 30 to 40 schools of choice students in the middle school uh, in grade seven each year. It, again, with COVID, however, our numbers um, have to be a little bit more strict. Um, the flex, when is the flex and AP exam? They are on April the 10th and April the something else. I can't, I forgot to write it down, but I'm sure one of my colleagues will be will be able to uh, let me know if they have that date. Um, and likely they are in April. They're on the website. They're on the application form. Actually, pardon me, they're on the application forms that will open tomorrow. Um, again, it's it's not likely that they will happen and therefore we'll be using the report cards as the greatest tool in order to just to figure out where your child should go. Oh, that was the next question. How do we determine? We will use that if there's a teacher recommendation, a parent checklist and uh, report cards, and uh, we often call our feeder schools and get a little bit more information if if deemed necessary. So in as far as a grade stu six student goes, we would like to see all fours mostly for students to be allowed into advanced. In flex, we want them to be at or above grade level, which would mean pretty much threes and fours across the board. Um, what is the the next one? I'm going to pass this over to Miss Macklin. It says, "What is the criteria of the advanced program?" Can you share a little bit, Miss Macklin, about what you believe, what you look for in an advanced student? Sure. Um, I would say that above and beyond the teacher recommendation and the fours on the report card, I think it's really important for kids to have, um, you know, a real passion for learning. I think that. Um, if I were to describe an AP student from my perspective in the classroom, I would say they were someone who is very engaged, uh, loves the conversation of the classroom, um, a student who is always asking questions, involved in dialogue, always just, you know, just has that zest for learning uh, and someone who really has a good sense of organization, uh, time management, you know, a person who most of our students actually are quite busy and they, you know, Pre-COVID, many of them, you know, had a lot of lessons that they would attend after school. They were very busy and they still had the time and were able to manage um, the workload. And um, so I think it's it's the kind of student who likes to be really involved in the community as well as their schoolwork and can just um, thrive off of all that, really. Yeah. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm... Uh, reading questions quickly as she was talking. Um, the next one I have here is, hello, do we have to decide at registration time if we want our child in a specific program or can we decide later? I think I'm live. Thumbs up if I'm live, gang. Okay, good. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yes, the application form will ask you about all three programs. You can apply for all three programs on your application form, um, or you can apply for one, two, or all, like I said, all three of them. So uh, we will probably, uh, if after we figure out the criteria, if you've applied for more than one program, we would probably call you to find out which program you are uh, hoping for in a first, second, or third choice. Um, uh, next question was, if you live in catchment, are you guaranteed a spot? Yes, you are guaranteed a spot at Grand Park High School. Again, unless it's uh, inclusion support student, or if um, you are guaranteed a spot, but you're not necessarily guaranteed a spot in adv advanced or flex, you would be just guaranteed a spot in general. Um, let's see here. A lot of questions about the um, advanced program assessment. So the assessment, if it does happen, it is a uh, basically it's a multiple choice test of about 110, 120 questions. It's already general knowledge questions that are mostly in math and um, numeracy and literacy with some problem solving as well. It's nothing that the students can um, study for. It's basically we want to see what they're at or and the problem with the respect to their literacy and numeracy and with respect to the problem solving solving portion. We want to see if they can think outside the box. I uh, answered that you can apply to more than one program. If you do apply for the advanced or flexible learning program, like I said, the dates for the assessment will be on your application form. You do not have to stand, sign up for the test separately. We will automatically send you an email telling you whether it's on or off when we get closer to that date. And yes, uh, again, with COVID, uh, even for students in the future who want to come to Grant Park, Hopefully we will we'll, we will return to that tool. It's a, you know, any exam for a 11 year old is not the greatest. That's why we don't like to use it, the word exam so much as an assessment, but um, we, we do use it as a tool just to try to get to know a little bit uh, more about them. I think we're, yeah. Uh... So, Someone wants to talk a little bit, um, if we can talk a little bit about our remote learning experience. Um, Mr. Olfert, how would you like to talk about a little bit about how things went when we were teaching remotely? Well, we've done some remote teaching last year in March till June, and we had another stint in January. And even in our school today, we are doing a sort of hybrid model where we have split the classrooms into smaller sizes and doing teaching of two rooms at once. And uh, there's been a little bit of uh, bumpiness to it, but I think we're all on the same kind of page here. We're doing a lot of Google Classroom, updating daily, keeping students informed on what we've been covering and what assignments are due. We've done live lessons uh, with students, and I know some of us have also done recorded lessons that have been uploaded. And we've done meeting times with students, a Q&A kind of like this. It takes a little getting used to, and in a middle school setting, it can be tough to motivate the kids, but um, I think it still works. Does anyone else want to add anything? Okay. I don't, I don't hear them jumping. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Olfert. Ms. McDonald, I'm picking on you next. Ms. McDonald and Mr. Olford are both two of our um, general teachers and we thank them very much. They were one of the ones that put a, together a, a beautiful video that was uh, linked on our website. Uh, Ms. McDonald, are students allowed to play video games in school such as Minecraft? I think you need to get your speaker on your, your mute button off, Ms. McDonald, thank you. Okay, video games, yes. Um, are they allowed to play? Well, we do, because of COVID, the kids are, of course, staying in the classrooms over the lunch hour. So kids do have an opportunity to play video games at that time. And um, uh, 
so that that is generally fine. Um, but during class time, we usually frown on them playing any kind of video games during class instruction or any kind of class time. We're expecting them, of course, to be working on their classwork and not their video games. However, in, in some occasions we do um, allow it um, if say this, the student is finished all of their work and they um, and there's some free time, if they have some free time available to them, we might allow it at that point. But generally speaking, we, we frown on kids playing video games at school, except for during, like I said, during lunch hours or occasionally during free time. I know there's um, recently the school division did send out to all our computers the uh, Minecraft for Education. I was talking to my kids about it. Is that something that I should be looking at? And of course they were definitely encouraging me to uh, perhaps <laughs> look at it, but I, I haven't had an opportunity. The kids were insisting that it, it could be educational, but that's something I still need to work on. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, much, much Miss McDonald. So many M's. All right, um, Miss Zimberg is one of our one, the other half of our gen, our advanced program, and I am going to ask her, what if a child gets accepted into? And I'm going to go to Mr. Semenik. You're next because you're going to talk about flex in the same regard. But what if a child gets accepted into the advanced program but is not doing well in it? Well, um, I guess this would probably be the case in any program and in any classroom. Um, first and foremost, um, we try really hard to keep in touch with parents. Um, communication happens all the time. So in particular in my classes, if students start dropping assignments or assignments aren't being handed in, um, an email will go home. Um, sometimes parents are aware, sometimes they're not. Sometimes that's all it takes is just a little bit of notice home. The assignments will come in and we're right back on track. Other times we need to work a little more closely with parents, um, maybe a weekly check in sort of thing to ensure that students are keeping up or are on track um, to, until that routine is reestablished. Um, but yeah, any, I mean, we are, we're here to help kids. That's what we want to do. We want to see students be successful. So we are available by email. Um, we answer any questions that parents or students may have. So we're working all the time to help kids feel successful. I think the most, one of the most important things though is it's really important, which is why tonight is such a great event. It's really important to, to take the time and, and really, um, choose that proper program for your child. There are lots of reasons to choose all of these programs, but you really need to make sure that you are being super honest about your child's ability. You're choosing the right program for the right reasons, and then there often isn't any issue. Obviously, if there is, we're here to help. We're an email away, um, and whatever we need to do to get students back on track, we will, we will do our best to do that. Thank you, Ms. Zimberg. And if I can just add, and I won't, I don't need to have my face on there, but if I can just add, um, it's very rarely do we have students that um, have left either the flexible learning or the gen or the advanced program. Um, if so, it it's mostly uh, in the advanced program, the occasional student, and it's usually the student that comes and says, you know what, um, there's, there's, this might be a little bit too fast for me. It might be a little bit too much homework. I'm really involved in hockey or I'm really involved in swimming and I do 20 hours of training each week because there will be honest. There is a, a little bit more homework in the advanced um, program and some most of the time it's the students that say mom, dad, let's talk about this um, and we'll have it will all we will always have a conversation. We would never do anything without involving everybody else. As far as uh, thank you, Miss Zimberg, I'm going to send Mr. Semenik in there now to talk a little bit about not just if a student does ends up not happy in the program, but maybe if you can explain a little bit about how the programming and um, in English language arts and um, math and science and social studies, how it works uh, with a combined classroom in the fle flexible learning program. OK, so that's a lot. Um, uh, I'll, talk about, <laughs> I'll talk about the um, kind of contact with parents and how we kind of deal with those situations. Um, personally, 
Um, I like kind of doing online check ins with students. I find that they're they're more comfortable um, if they're filling out a Google form. So I kind of do those uh, periodically throughout the year. Um, a lot of them feel more comfortable kind of behind the computer, as I think a lot of people do, where um, they can fill in this form, tell us, if, so, hey, something's going on at home, or I'm just busy, or sometimes they'll fully admit, hey, I'm just been slacking for the last little while. Um, so it's really nice to kind of get that honest feedback kind of directly from the students. Um, we also have uh, flex parent meetings. Uh, we actually just had one the other night. Um, so we communicate directly with the parents. It gives parents an opportunity to ask us questions, us to communicate kind of some things that are going on, some events that are coming up um, and other things that are kind of going on throughout the school year. Um, on top of kind of all the things that Ms. Zimberg mentioned, right, with um, emailing home and phoning and talking to the students kind of ahead of time. Um, as for the next portion of that, I think it was kind of um, discussing how English and, and kind of the class system works in the FLEX program. Um, for us, um, we've combined uh, our classes. So we have mixed seven and eight home rooms. Um, so during social studies and science, um, we combine them. So the sevens are mixed in with the eights and we kind of do the curriculum all together at once. Um, so this year we're teaching the grade seven curriculum to both our sevens and eights, while um, next year we're gonna teach that the, the grade eight curriculum to both years. So the new sevens who are coming in. Um, we can do that because the curriculums in social studies and science are not necessarily building upon each other. Um, so we're allowed to kind of have that freedom and we kind of work together. Um, so we've got our leaders in grade eights helping out our grade sevens um, who are new to the school. Um, I think that covers everything. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Semenek. I'm going back to Ms. Zim Ms. Um, Macklin. Um, she is also our team leader of the grade seven in, uh, in our in our whole building, grade grade seven team leader. And um, I'm going to ask her a little bit about um, what when we talk about our advanced program being advanced, and we just heard a little bit from Mr. Semenek about. Um, uh, how the flexible learning program works. It's a combined grade classroom. Um, they do the curriculum a little bit differently. Can you explain to us what uh, the advanced program is? I We often use the word accelerated as well. Can you explain a little bit about that, please? Sure, yeah, we say accelerated and enriched just because we do move along um, quite a bit faster in our curricular outcomes. So for example, um, we kind of geared toward kids who typically in grade six tended to be bored because the material came at them, they did it, and then they usually had to become the, the school or the classroom helpers. So AP is really um, geared toward those kids who need that enrichment. Um, they need the extras. So for example, if you're doing a novel study, they're doing lots of reading and not just comprehension questions, but we do more inquiry-based work with the novel and they have discussions. And so we tend to dive a lot deeper into the material and move through it faster. So kids are really challenged um, and they have more of an opportunity to have that hands on um, approach to learning with us. Um, so I think because we're able to move through the curricular outcomes faster, then um, it's usually set up and geared towards kids who just, um, yeah, can just move it through it faster. Um, did I answer all that? I think there was another part B to that, Ms. McEachern. But I lost it. <laughs> uh, yep, so did I because I was reading the next question and getting prepared right. for it. So oh, yeah. um, did anyone want to pipe yeah. in if they knew what their shoes talking about? <laughs> yeah, I That's think so, yeah, the, the enrichment, um, how fast we move through it. Um, Ms. Zimmerg, did I miss anything? Yeah, I'm just going to add um, a little bit to that just with respect to the math and science, mm -hmm. uh, which I teach. So for example, in um, math, I'll make sure that we cover the, and I teach grade seven math, so I'll make sure that we cover outcomes um, from grade seven, grade eight, and actually some grade nine curricular outcomes. And in science, we actually will do five clusters compared to four, which is in a typical science grade seven year. Um, so that between the five clusters that we cover in grade seven, and the additional clusters that they cover in grade eight, by the time they're finished the um, AP grade eight year, they've actually covered all of the grade seven outcomes, all of the grade eight outcomes, and half of the grade nine outcomes. And that just kind of keeps them on the path of accelerating so that by the time they are, you know, in grade 11, for example, if they continue on an AP track, they are um, working on grade 12 classes. 
um, then sort of ultimately opening them up in grade 12 to take those um, AP courses for actual university credit. So that's one of the um, nice things about sort of accelerating through the curriculum. And yeah. then if I could add one thing, in yeah. social studies and English, we don't actually move through, um, you know, different units that would be sort of taught in grade nine, let's say for English and social studies. But what I do do is I start with early man, early peoples, and that way when they go to grade eight, Miss Brass, who's the grade eight teacher, can just kind of um, start at um, a further unit and that way the kids can move through their material a lot faster too. And then in English, uh, just to add to that too, um, you know, we may go into some classics. We may look into Shakespeare. Um, and so that's how we move along faster in English language arts as well. So I would say more of uh, we need students who are critical thinkers and who really um, need that enrichment. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that um, are added to that is that I'll just uh, continue on for just one more moment is that the subject areas that are considered advanced or accelerated in grade seven are the four core area subjects. Phys Ed, they also do go to Phys Ed usually with another group, but I know in physical education when they have just the one group, um, they often try to do a little bit more advanced stuff with respect to the health portion mostly. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Miss uh, Curry. She again is uh, one of our flexible learning teachers. This question really doesn't have anything to do with flex. It has to do with a whole school question, Miss Curry. But uh, what are our students coming every day or are we doing remote learning right now? Right now we have kids coming to school every day. So uh, it's nice to see these faces. We originally started the school year with kids in the classroom, half of the kids in the classroom uh, having lessons with their teachers. And then the next day they would come to school and work in a, an alternate space where they would do the, the work for the lessons that they received the day before. Um, it cut down the amount of teacher time we had with kids. So we decided to revamp things after we came back from online learning in January. So now we are uh, delivering lessons to all of our kids at the same time. So some classrooms are set up where the teacher's in one classroom and the kids are online and she delivers or he delivers the lesson um, via uh, camera and the other kids hear the lesson and then the teacher just rotates through the classrooms to answer any questions. Uh, for the flex grade seven and eight kids and for the grade seven AP kids, um, they're in one big space. So uh, Mr. Semenik and I, for example, are in the cafeteria two meters apart with the kids. So we have both of our homeroom kids um, in one space and we would deliver an English lesson to everyone. And then the both of us would team teach and then move around and answer any questions. Um, so we have the kids every day, which was nice because when they had the second day in the alternate space, we weren't there when they needed uh, to ask questions. We weren't there when they were kind of unclear about the concepts or the material that we taught. So um, we're enjoying the, the full day with kids quite a bit. So they're with us every day. So the next question from Kristen was, will the kids be doing alternating days with being in class and being in the gym with EAs like last September to December of this year? Um, so that was our, for those of you that are not really sure what that all means, is this past year we had, when we first had to socially distant, we, um, we had it was at one meter and we in order to do that we had to use different areas so we decided to have one day of independent study in an alternate location and then their teachers see them the next day for the full day and we did that from september till december and then over the christmas break in the two weeks of remote learning um, a couple teachers and myself we kind of came up with this idea is maybe we can get them all in and even we cleared out a bunch of classrooms so even we could make them now two meters apart because the protocols did change and uh, we were able to do that and much what miss um, curry just said was that we had to uh, use places like the cafeteria like the gym and although we of course don't feel that this is best teaching practices it's the best we can do to have our kids in the school um, every day it was a resounding amount of parents that kept telling us that their kids needed 
that that extra day was not good and their children were really unhappy with it. So we were able to do this where they are coming in every day. We do not offer remote learning at this time, whereas your elementary school may be. Um, some elementary schools were able to uh, offer remote or in-class learning with their students. Um, we are not offering that because we have been able to fit everybody in. Now again, COVID protocols can change um, every week whenever there's a press conference. So I'm going to go to Mr. Olfert right now and I'm going to ask him a little bit about some of the extracurricular activities, sports, clubs that all our students um, depend not. It doesn't depend. It doesn't matter which program they're in. All our clubs, sporting events, everything is for everyone. So he, I'd like him to share a little bit about some of the things that we offer. It is for everyone when it's available and COVID has made that uh, very tricky. Uh, there are still a few clubs that can operate virtually, but um, a lot of our sports, I think all of our sports have been ceased for this year. But in a normal year, we have pretty much every sport you can imagine. And as far as extracurricular clubs goes, if a student or two students come up with an idea and they find a teacher who's willing, we can have a club. I know there was a couple years ago a club for listening to K-pop music that just kids wanted to do it and they found a teacher who was willing to open up their room at lunch so they had a little club. Um, I personally run the Dungeons and Dragons club and I've enjoyed it. We tried to do it distanced this year with um, just through text and through video and uh-huh uh-huh I don't know what that means. Everyone's pointing at me and they're all clapping. I don't know what they're doing, <laughs> but I choose to ignore them. And I'm just going to keep going. So we have a lot of things that we do here and I think it's uh, a lot of fun. So I don't know what else to say. We have all the sports. They're good. That's great. So I'll, um, I'm going to put Mr. Semenik back on the spot. And uh, Miss Curry, feel free to uh, jump in if you uh, would like, because this one's this one's a goodie. Um, it is my understanding that the Flex program is designed for students who benefit from a certain style of learning, collaborative group work, inquiry-based learning projects, etc. If my child has some twos on her report card, does that mean that she will automatically be excluded from this program? Definitely not. <laughs> um, you're right in the fact that we do a lot of collaboration. We do a lot of group work. Um, we do cross curricular projects. Um, we try and get everybody working together as much as we can. Um, all of that um, is not necessarily dependent on whether a student gets a two or a three or a four um, and what they've done their previous year. Um, it's all about kind of are you able to work with somebody? Are you able to kind of keep up with the pace that we're at? Um, so if um, we are working on a cross curricular project. That means we've kind of finished our units a little bit quicker than kind of um, other classes normally would have. Um, so we, we do kind of move at a bit of a faster pace, um, but does that eliminate people based on their grades or their, their, their ones or twos or threes or fours? Definitely not. Um, it's more about can you work with somebody? Can you maintain the, the amount of workload that we keep up and um, work um, with each other. I don't know if Ms. Curry has anything to add to that. <laughs> no, I think you pretty much covered it. I just want parents and families at home to be thinking of what a good fit for their child is, right? So uh, twos on the report card could look very different when they've matured over the summer and we get them in grade seven. Um, but if you think your child has twos because they're not so willing to do the homework or or the legwork to, to do well in the program, then uh, we have to think about their happiness and their confidence and their success and you want them to commit to flex for two years. So if um, this is a child that you struggle to kind of get motivated, that kind of thing, maybe um, it won't be the, the happiest of two years and maybe it will. It, it really all depends. If we see twos on a report card, we're not putting them to the side. We're looking at the big picture. We're looking at all the other key components that we use to kind of evaluate who is a good fit for the program for sure. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that just made jumped out at me when she said it is a commitment for two years. For those of you who are wondering what happens after Flex is done for their two years um, when they go into grade eight or grade nine, pardon me. Um, grade nine, they can choose between going, they will go into the general program unless they apply for the advanced program and they certainly are welcome to apply. We do recommend that they have quite high marks, high 80s or mostly 90s, um, and they may have to do a little bit of math catch up over the summer in order for them to go into the advanced program in the fall. Uh, the majority of FLEX students go into the general program from 9 to 12, but there are those that uh, decide that they want to have the extra challenge and continue on in that the other stream as well. We do ask that uh, when you do make a commitment to Grant Park, um, that it is a commitment to the program. The advanced program and both FLEX and all three of our programs are, are um, very sought after. So for those people who know that they want their child to go to private school in grade nine, um, that's great. We wish you well, but our programs are really meant for our students to come to Grant Park and hopefully graduate from Grant Park. So uh, we want to put the commitment to you, into your child and we would we appreciate the commitment to our programs and uh, because if you have no uh, desire to stay at Grant Park for your child's graduation, we do ask politely that maybe you leave that spot for somebody else who um, is also trying to get into the programs. OK, thank you so much. I'm going to send it back to Miss McDonald and she's going to talk a little bit about what our grade seven students do during the lunch hour. And um, maybe if you could start with a normal year, Miss uh, Miss McDonald, and then talk about what we're doing for COVID. And you need to turn on your mic. <laughs> OK, lunch hours in a normal year. Yes, we can only hope that next year is normal. Uh, the kids actually, the students have a lot of freedom at lunchtime. They can leave the school. Um, often the kids like to go to pick up their lunch somewhere um, or they want to go to the mall. Um, so they are they do have that freedom to do that. We also have a cafeteria space that can be used at lunchtime as well. So that is open um, so they can go down into the cafeteria and eat their lunch there if they want to do that. Um, oftentimes when it's really cold outside, that's where we'll find them. Um, they can go outside on nicer days and uh, sit outside on the uh, grass and um, enjoy the outdoors at lunchtime. So they do they do experience a fair bit of freedom at lunchtime and this is different and usually the kids are looking forward to this. Um, often the uh, in a normal year we would also have um, noon hour sports on or some days maybe open gym and some days some intramural sports and they would rotate through a number of different sports like um, soccer, badminton, uh, those kinds of things at lunchtime. So there's and there's often sports going on uh, or pardon me other clubs I've run a, a knitting club um, for a few years and we've done that at lunchtime. I know there's Dungeon and Dragons, there's chess clubs, so there's all kinds of things for kids to get involved with at lunchtime. That's in a normal year. Unfortunately, <laughs> now it's a, a little more restrictive. Kids do not leave the school at lunchtime. They stay in their designated classrooms and they eat in their designated spaces. They are to maintain um, the two meter distance. Uh, uh, we have monitors who um, check on the classrooms, who wander around and check in on the kids and make sure that they are um, adhering to the rules as best we can can help them out in that regard. Um, so what I've seen in my own classroom is that um, kids sometimes will play some kind of joint game uh, together uh, at lunchtime um, or they'll sit and chat with their friends or they'll uh, listen to music or something like that. Uh, sometimes we've even put movies on for them at lunchtime if they ask. We've uh, that kind of thing, trying to keep <laughs> trying to make lunch, uh, you know, a fun time for them to relax and and enjoy themselves a little bit. At least, unfortunately, COVID has really uh, restrained a lot of that. 
Thank you. Um, we're going to take two more questions, I think, and then for those people that would like to continue on, we can stay a little bit longer. Um, for those of you who have to go, we are almost at our hour. But um, Dean, um, one of the parents would like to know a little bit about the length of the school day and basically how our classes. Tell me a little bit about uh, a regular school day for a grade seven student because it's going to be quite different from elementary school. OK, uh, regular school day at Grant Park it consists of five hour long periods. We start at nine o'clock uh, where we have O Canada and our homerooms and then we move to our first period class. In a normal year, the students will go through the halls and go to their teacher's classroom. And then there's another class at 10.04 and then at 11.11. And we break for lunch at 12.18 and we're back at it again at 1.20. And we have two classes in the afternoon. So it's it can be a little bit longer having an hour long class, but it's usually not someone standing talking for an hour. So that's that's a relief. There's time to usually move around and uh, do activities or do some assignments and get a little bit of a change in pace. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, this last question will be for um, Buffy and Lisa and they're re with respect to the advanced program. For those of you that will need to get going uh, shortly, that will be fine. I will answer the questions with respect to support services uh, for students that may need a little bit of extra help in the classroom. If those people want it, would like to be able to hang on, I can do that next after this one. So Buffy and Lisa, if your student graduates from the advanced program in grade 12, do the universities recognize this program differently than a general program? They don't, do they? Yeah, no, no actually. Um, I don't believe they do. Um, the it's just going to be strictly their grade 12 marks on their transcripts. So depending um, on from which program a student graduates, the universities, I believe the ones in Manitoba are just looking at grade 12 course grades. Um, however, that being said, as I had mentioned previously, um, if a student does sort of follow throughout the AP track, it does accelerate them through the courses to the point that when they are in grade 12, they do have that um, opportunity in their timetable to take those AP, actually <clears throat> designated AP courses for university credit. I do believe those courses might be open to anybody, um, but students who are who have kind of traveled through the AP program could potentially be a little more prepped for that kind of experience. Um, and then during grade 12, those students have the time in their timetables to select those courses. And if they do well in those actual AP designated courses, um, are able to secure that as that university entrance level course while they're in grade 12, saving a lot of time and, and money. Yeah. And I would like to add to that um, more importantly, even if you like even if a student decides to take first year university courses, even though they don't have to, I think it's the experience and the exposure to um, the expectations at that university level when they're in grade 12. So I'll use English as an example again. If a student has taken grade 12 English with some of the AP teachers, they go into that university class really having um, really known and felt what it would look like in a university university classroom and so they know what the expectations are you know um, I think that's really important so many of our students have come back and said to us AP really prepared us for a university because of the expectations over the years absolutely thank you so much um, so it is actually 702 so I will hang on if any of my colleagues need to go and uh, attend their parental duties, uh, get home to uh, prep for tomorrow. Uh, you're welcome to uh, to go for those parents that would like to hang on and have me answer a few more questions. I'm happy to do so for a little while longer. So um, we have a question about uh, electives. We do offer four, we call them options. We offer four options, French, band, visual arts, and performing arts. Um, this year we are trying to give almost everybody a taste of all four, but normally in a non-COVID year, you're gonna hear that a lot, is that they get to choose two out of the four. And uh, whatever two that they choose, 
most students keep with those throughout their um, for the two years of middle school and when they get into grade nine they often have other electives or options that they can choose as well um, so the they get to pick their first their top two and if we're able to we try to give everybody their top two choices we have a question here that uh, we got, if somebody used to live in uh, St. James School Division and now is in the Winnipeg School Division, can we use those teachers out of division for recommendations? Absolutely. We do have a recommendation standard form that is meant for the grade six teacher. Um, we don't usually go to grade five or grade four or anything like that. We usually just do the most current year of grade six. Our middle school students in contact with, I see my colleagues have not left me, so I'm going to throw it at some one of them again. Let's see who am I going to pick on now? Who hasn't spoken in a while? How about we'll go to Miss McDonald again? I can't remember, I'm losing track. Our middle school students in contact with the older grades. Um, well, that contact is kept to a minimum between the middle school. Uh, most of the middle school classes in a normal year are located in the hallway four. There are some classes in grade or in the hallway three. Um, yes, they will see high, high school students, um, but generally just in the hallways. Um, during options, they do, um, if they are, pardon me, during practical arts, they may need to travel into areas of the school that do have high school students. Uh, we generally don't have a problem um, with that. Um, I, at first, the kids might feel um, a little intimidated the first few weeks, but it seems that as time goes by, they get more and more used to it, and it's not really an issue. That is correct. Thank you very much. We do, yes, we keep the middle school students kind of tucked away, um, very safe. And to be honest, the um, high school kids really remember what it's like to be in grade seven. And um, they really don't, uh, to be honest, don't really care about the grade sevens when they're in grade 12. So they certainly don't go looking to uh, go start a conversation with a grade seven child. Um, uh, it never happens really, unless they have siblings in the older grades. Um, I did mention that I was going to talk a little bit about supports for those parents that are concerned that their children may be on an IEP in elementary school. Of course, being on an IEP, um, that is not a, a problem. Uh, there are a number of students that uh, may be having working at their own pace. They may not exactly be at grade level. There may be students that are above grade level. If students are one year below grade level, they require an IEP, which means that our teachers um, take a little bit extra time to check in on that child and know exactly what areas need to be focused on to try to bring them up and get them uh, moving forward. Um, if our, a child is two grade levels above, then we all, they also would have an IEP and teachers would be providing parents with information on how they're keeping their child challenged. We have a resource teacher that is available to us in the middle school. Uh, in an, a normal year, we have a resource room where some of our students that require extra support would be, we don't necessarily do a pull out, but we may have, for example, if a student, more, most students take two electives, we may offer them to just drop one of those electives. So instead of taking French and band, they may not take French and band and then we give them resource uh, support in those in those two periods of the cycle where they uh, could go in and get some extra help and extra support. Um, resource support is different than inclusion support. Uh, it's uh, the inclusion support program, like I said, is a division run program and we're basically told who is coming to our school in those programs. A uh, resource support is uh, our students that are just functioning slightly below or a little bit below grade level and we can provide them that resource resource support. We only have bus service for students who are in the inclusion support program. Nobody else is uh, at grade seven. You are not allowed bus service unless you are in that program or you're in a in a specialty program. When will st sports be open? No idea. That would probably be Dr. Rusin's uh, call on that one. 
Um, I'm seeing a few, quite a, a lot of these I have. Uh, OK, so I think I can send this one to uh, Mark. Are you ready to take a question? And while I'm getting that one ready for him, I will just answer this one here from Karam. If we are living out of catchment and I have all four, if my child has all fours, does it make me more likely to get accepted? And absolutely, when you're out of catchment, the higher your marks are, uh, if you would be bumped up to the top of the list of the third round of students that are going to uh, be accepted uh, to meet that criteria. Mark, are there microwaves available at lunchtime? Um, on a normal year, yes. Um, in the cafeteria, usually there's a couple of microwaves available down there. Um, however, um, this year um, with COVID, like everything else has kind of limited everything. Um, so microwaves are not really permitted in any of the classrooms, so they're not really allowed um, to be used right now. Thank you very much. And um, there's a question here that asks which AP courses in grade 12 can count for credit? There's quite a few of them uh, with respect to chemistry, physics, psychology, um, uh, pre-cal. Uh, there's quite a few of them. You would have to look at the handbook and it's on our website with respect to AP courses. Uh, we're the middle school folk, so we uh, I know those handful come to the top of my head, but that's about it uh, that I can think of right now. Where could my teacher find the recommend recommendation form that will be on the website and you'll be able to download it and forward it to your teacher on by email? Um, let's see here, Miss Macklin, let's pick on you this time. Do you, what, on the first day of school, are parents able to see the school or go to the area where the kids are? No, so on the first day of school, um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, some parents would walk their kids into the classroom so they could figure out where they were going. Um, but obviously now no parents are entering the school. If they need to get in contact with kids, they need to contact the office. So things are obviously much more secure than they normally would be. Thank you. And you know what? Middle school kids really want to be, for the most part, they want to be independent and responsible and they like to walk in by themselves. But we certainly understand there are those that are experiencing anxiety that may need a little bit of extra support. And on a normal year, we would probably allow that parent to walk their child right to the classroom and say goodbye at the classroom door. But we can't do that right now as long as we still have to screen. Um, but if you are if you're concerned about that, of course, give me an email or a uh, text or not a text, an email or a phone call, and we'll try to make sure that uh, everybody's taken care of. With respect to wheelchairs, aids, and such like that for special needs, we have students from all different backgrounds and abilities. We have some students that have um, oh service dogs. Thank you. Can think of the word. We have students that. Uh, maybe riding different contraptions throughout the hallway to practice their physical therapy or their occupational therapy. Uh, our whole building is wheelchair accessible. I think we're only going to do a couple more here and then um, we're going to call it quits because we've gone 50, we'll, we'll go to 715. And uh, are we able to get a virtual tour today? That's a very good question, Anonymous. <laughs> Um, we never really thought about that, but I know there is a piece of the video on the general video that has a little bit of walking around the hallway and maybe what I will see if I can get one of my staff to do a little bit more of that walking around the hallway and showing you different areas of the school. We did have another video that showed um, more areas of the school in it. It was a student um, made video. And it was excellent in showing where, what students really want to see from a kid's perspective. However, they put on Star Wars music on it. So therefore, we weren't allowed to publish it on our website because of copyright infringement. So um, that's something, thank you, we will uh, take a look at. 
Um, I can't post the recommendation form link there at this time. That's something my secretary has. So you'll have to get it from the from the link website tomorrow. Um, who would like to speak about the extracurricular option opportunities with respect to theater and dance? Would anyone like to speak towards the middle school musical? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that one. All right. Thank you, Miss Macklin. Believe it or not, parents, my staff was actually doing the nose rule. <laughs> <laughs> Last one to touch the nose. Uh, yes, they are. We are true middle schoolers at heart. So thank you, Miss Macklin. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, middle school musical? Yeah, so um, the middle school uh, musical happens every year, of course, pre COVID and uh, both grade seven and eight students are able to audition. Um, and the nice thing is that even if kids don't get a specific part, um, if they audition, they still can be part of the chorus and they can still participate in all of the production. Um, so that's really nice to give everybody an opportunity, even if they don't make one of the, you know, like the, the main cast. Um, and in terms of choir, choir, there's no choir until grade nine, I believe, but um, yeah, but musical is for seven and eights, and then they can also move up in grade nine to 12 as well and do uh, musical and drama productions. I think that was it for the question, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Macklin. Sorry, I was a little quick on my um, changing you, taking you off the screen. No problem. Um, so just to uh, follow up uh, quickly, the, with respect to students getting here, yes, they would get here on their own. They can walk in groups, they can ride the bus, the transit bus, pardon me. Uh, we have parents that send their kids by taxi. We, you know, everybody, we have people that carpool, but it is the responsibility of the parent to get the students here. And our students allowed to use cell phones. We do allow the use of cell phones in some of our classes, actually in a lot of our classes, but right now we have managed to get a Chromebook for every student. Uh, so we don't use them so much, but uh, in the past we have. Um, so yes, it, it depends on whether or not we, um, we, the teacher allows it. All right, so um, I will let everybody go. It is 7.15. Uh, Susan Cook, thank you for the email, for the question. Yes, you can give me a call at the school tomorrow. Anyone else that has any other questions that they want answered in person, you can call me and if you've got a pen, I'll give you the phone number. It's 204-452-3112, extension 503, or just ask for Bonnie, the vice principal, there are two Bonnies here, so it helps if you say the Bonnie, the vice principal, and I would be happy to talk to uh, anybody privately or my at my email address is on the website, as are the other teachers that are here. Our emails are all on the on the website. So I want to thank everybody so much for we're we've got 50 people still on. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your evening today to join us. We hope we answered some questions. Our our building, our middle school is based on commitment and caring for one another and community. And that's what we focus on. We're a little, we're a, a big, small family in a larger school. And we um, we have a we have a great time and we provide a ton of opportunity for the kids when we can. And I just want to thank my staff who took the uh, night to help me out. And uh, yes, please contact us if you have any other questions. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.